How many of you love history? How many history buffs are, are in the room? Quite a few of you. I have to be honest, when I was in high school, I hated history class. Absolutely hated it. I don't know if it was maybe my teachers, that they were just boring, but I was not a fan of history at all. But when I became a Christian, I discovered that history is really his story. And because of that, I love history now because I see it through a, a whole different lens. And the book of Esther is a great example of that. And the, today we're beginning this study in really this very interesting and unique book of the Bible. And here's the uniqueness of it. The name of God is not mentioned in this book at all. There are no prayers there are no sacrifices, there are no offerings, there are no pictures of the cross or pictures of Christ, but despite the absence of the name of God, God is at work all through this book. He is writing throughout the book and sending this message, I am God and I am here. And everything that is happening is happening according to my divine plan. You know, the, the major theological point of the book of Esther is that God fulfills his covenant promises through what theologians call the providence of God. And that word providence is an interesting word. It's actually a, an interesting concept. The word providence comes from a Latin word, providentia. Pro means before or ahead of time. And videntia comes from the word verde, meaning to see. So you put that together and you have seeing ahead of time, which is exactly what God does. He sees everything ahead of time, something that we can't do. You know, for us, we have great history, right? Our hindsight is always 2020. We, we, when we are looking back, we always see and we see with a, a sense of understanding. But our prophecy is really, really lousy. We have a really, really hard time with foresight, seeing things ahead. And so we really don't have a clue what ultimately is going to happen tomorrow or next week or next month or even next year. And for a lot of us, that drives us crazy, right? Not knowing. Being in the dark. And we find ourselves playing that what-if game, but our invisible God who as we are singing is always moving, always working, that our invisible God in his providence is continually and constantly and confidently at work. He never changes, he never wavers, he's never absent, even when we feel like he might be. And the story of Esther stands as a wonderful reminder of how God is often at work behind the scenes. That he is working in the unseen ways, in the events of our lives. And here's what I want you to catch, is that many, many times as God is working, the things that he is doing right now, the things that God is doing right now in, in, in all of your lives are not for today. They're for two years from now. They're for five years from now. And right now, we find ourselves in that place where we're like going, I don't understand what you're doing. God, I don't know where you are. God, I feel like I'm all alone. But he's working, right? Amen? As we were singing? He's always working. But what he's doing and what he's working isn't for right now, but it's for two years from now. And two years from now, you're going to be like this. Oh, now I get it. Now I understand. Now I see what you were doing back there in the midst of that difficult time. Now I see it, God. I can't tell you the amount of times in my life that I found myself in this place going, God, I have no idea what you're doing right now. I have no clue. Lord, this makes no sense to me. And two years later, five years later, I come to this place where I'm like, oh, now I get it. Now I understand. 
the truth of your word that we have in Romans chapter 8 is actually real. Because in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, this is what we're told. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. So then I go, oh, now I get it. But here's what I want you to understand. When he says all things work together for good, it's really, he's talking about God's good, which ultimately means our good, and it's for the purpose of God, which ultimately relates to our purpose in life, because we have been made for his purpose. We have been made to live in relationship with him. So Esther is one of those kind of stories where God is laying out years in advance for his purposes to be fulfilled at a strategic time in history. And before we dive into this, let's let's introduce ourselves. I want to introduce you to, there's five key characters in this story. There's, first of all, a pagan king by the name of Ahasuerus. We're going to talk about him a lot today, also known as Xerxes. There's a strong-minded queen named Vashti. We'll meet her really next week. There's a wicked officer in Ahasuerus's kingdom named Haman, and he will be the instrument of Satan that seeks to exterminate all of the Jewish people living in Persia. There's an older Jewish man named Mordecai, a cousin to our heroine of the story, a young Jewish orphan named Hadassah that we know as Esther. And Esther's story is a beautiful message to anybody here who has ever experienced brokenness, for anyone who has ever been crushed by life, for anyone who's ever felt that their past is so discolored, so disjointed, and so fractured that there's no way in the world that God could make any meaning or reason out of it. This is Esther's story. I mean, think about this. This little girl, as a little girl, loses her mom and dad. She must have cried her eyes and heart out at that reality. But years later, she would come to discover that God had chosen her to be the key instrument in the survival of a whole nation. The setting of this story is Persia, which is modern-day Iran. And a little bit of history As to how we got here in the book of Esther, how we get to this point in history, I think is helpful. You see, Babylon, which is modern day Iraq, was in power in the Middle East for 400 years. They were the superpower in the world at that time. And during part of the reign, toward the tail end of it, uh, in 605 B.C. to 562 B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar, how many of you have heard of him? King Nebuchadnezzar. He was the ruler in Babylon, and in 586 B.C., he invades Israel. He invades the city of Jerusalem, and he took a bunch of the people captive and carted them back to Babylon, including the youngest and the brightest men in the the kingdom or in the land of Israel. And this is when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, all those guys get taken off to Babylon. And Israel's captivity in Babylon was really the fulfillment of what what God had promised Israel if they rebelled against him. God said, if you rebel against me, and if you turn from worshiping me to worshiping idols, I'm going to allow a power to come in and take you all captive. And that's exactly what happened. And during that Babylonian invasion by King Nebuchadnezzar, another thing happened in Israel. As they came in, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Now, the temple in Jerusalem was built by King Solomon. And it was considered one of the ancient wonders of the world. I mean, it was just grand in the way that God had instructed very, very clearly how this temple was to be built. That it was actually to be a bit of a a, a small picture, but a picture of heaven. 
And that temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and the people were carted off into um, captivity. And as that temple was destroyed, it was a picture of Israel in its glory under Solomon was now gone. It was over. And so now we have the temple destroyed. We have the people living in captivity. And in 539 BC, a leader by the name of Cyrus the Great led the Persian army to come in and defeat Babylon. Now what's crazy about this, don't miss this, This was the fulfillment of an amazing prophecy that Isaiah the prophet had prophesied. In Isaiah 44, beginning in verse 28 through verse 7 of Isaiah 45, Isaiah gave this prophecy that there would come a leader from Babylon, or excuse me, from Persia, that would come in and defeat the Babylonians. Isaiah's writing this 200 years before the event. And get this, he names the leader who's going to come. He he calls him by name. He says, there's going to be a Persian leader named Cyrus. And he's writing this 150 years before Cyrus was even born. How crazy is that? And it happens. And listen, secular history even verifies that all of these events are true. And once in power, once the Persians and Cyrus were in power, God moves on Cyrus's heart that the children of Israel could go back to the land of Jerusalem, back to the land of Israel, to rebuild their temple. You can read about that in, in Ezra chapter 1. That God literally moves on this king's heart and he issues this decree that the children of Israel were free to go back to their land and to rebuild their temple. And he he adds this, and Persia's gonna pay for it. I mean, how incredible is that? And that was a prophecy that Jeremiah had said would happen long before this even took, or Persia came into power. So God just, it's incredible. His foresight, his providence in seeing things ahead of time. But here's what's interesting. The decree is given, the permission is given for the people of Israel to go back, but only a remnant of them go. The rest of them stayed in Persia. You know why? They were real comfortable in Persia. They had jobs, they had houses. It was a nice life, living in the luxury of Persia. For many of them, they were more Persian than Jewish. And so very few of them went back. And I think this provides a very stark contrast for all of us. And I want you to hear me on this. You see, the Bible makes it very, very clear that this world is not our home. That that we are not a part of this kingdom. That we belong to another kingdom. Let me read to you how Paul the Apostle put it in Colossians chapter 1. He says, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. You see Paul saying? Hey, he says, You who believe in Jesus Christ, you've been taken out of one kingdom the kingdom of darkness, and you have been put into the kingdom of God. And over and over again in the pages of Scripture, the Lord admonishes us as his people to not get too comfortable in this kingdom. That we are to find the balance between being in this world, but not of this world. To understand that we've been left in this world to make an impact in this world, but for another kingdom, for his kingdom. And so the book of Esther, this is the timeline, takes place 50 years after the decree of King Cyrus to go and rebuild the temple. 
Ahasuerus, the grandson of Cyrus, is now on the throne in Persia. He is the father of Artaxerxes, for you Bible students, who will be the king on the throne when Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah happens. So with that as a backdrop, let's now begin our story. Look at verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, and this was the Ahasuerus, who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. Now, now pause there for a minute. You need to understand, okay? This means nothing to you if you don't know about the Middle East. You're like, okay, how big is that? I'll tell you how big that is, okay? From India to Ethiopia, I mean, this is a large landmass, so big that it would be the equivalent if you took two maps of the United States and put them one on top of the other, that's the landmass, the territory that he controlled. I mean, we're talking huge. This guy was the superpower in the world at that time. Verse two tells us, and in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel. Now Shushan was the summer palace of the, or excuse me, it was the winter palace of the Persian king. And it was in a desert area, very pretty desert area, but it was way too hot in the summer. So they would spend a lot of time, the winter months, the spring months in there, but in the summer it was too hot. So they would go to one of their other palace areas. And Ahasuerus ascended the throne in November of 486 BC when he was 32 years of age. Now we read in verse three, that in the third year of his reign, so he's 35 now, he made a feast. For all of his officials and servants and the powers of Persia and Medea and the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. And when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days. How many days? 180 days in all. Can you believe that? This is a 180 day banquet. This is a six-month party that would make today's celebrity blowouts look like a stingy potluck or a backyard barbecue. I mean, this was, no, you know, no holds bar. I mean, just nothing was spared because the whole purpose of this was to show how radical, how great, how awesome the king of Ahasuerus was. Look at verse 5. And when the days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan, the citadel, from the great to the small in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So Ahasuerus brings this six-month party to a close by inviting everybody in the kingdom, both small and great, to come for these final seven days. And in verses 6 through 8, we are given a description of the beauty and the grandeur of his palace. Notice it says, And there were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars and couches were of gold gold and silver on mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, white, and black marble. And they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other. How crazy is that? With royal wine in abundance according to the generosity of the king. And in accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory. I mean, it wasn't wasn't forced so that the king had ordered all the officers of his household that, that they should do according to each man's pleasure, but they didn't, they indulged in abundance. Taking in the king's wine. So Ahasuerus, he's 35 years old and rich beyond imagination. It's hard for us to get a picture of it and just reading, you know, this description of the gold and the marble floors and and all of that and gold vessels and gold and silver couches. But when Alexander the Great conquers Persia, And he comes into the palace at Shushan. What he discovered in today's dollars was the equivalent. This is what he found of a wealth there 
of 500, or excuse me, of 54.5 billion in bullion and 270 tons of minted gold. And we're talking wealthy. Now, here's the thing. The purpose of this six-month part, six party was to put on display the greatness of Ahasuerus. In fact, archaeologists excavating Shushan have found inscriptions in which this king revert, refers to himself as the great king, as the king of kings, as the king of all the lands occupied by many races, as the king of all of the earth. Think he was on a little bit of an ego trip? Inscriptions all over of how awesome he was. But that's how man is, right? Remember Muhammad Ali? Remember when he was the boxing champ? Remember what he used to always say? I'm the greatest. He had to tell us that. Like we didn't know, you know? I'm the greatest. Reminds me, there was a time when Ali was flying on an airplane and he didn't want to buckle his seatbelt. So the stewardess came by and said, Mr. Ali, you need to buckle your seatbelt. And he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she fired back, Superman don't need no airplane. <laughs> The purpose of this six-month extravaganza was to impress the leaders of the 127 provinces. And here's why. Ahasuerus wanted to launch a military campaign against the Grecian Empire. And he knew that he would need the support of all 127 of them in order to win it. Now, here's what's interesting. Persia... Ahasuerus, would lose that war. The kingdom of Persia would be defeated by the Grecian Empire, and this is what Ahasuerus and nor anyone else who was mesmerized by the opulence of the display of grandeur at that party, none of them realized this at all, that the glory of this kingdom wasn't going to last. But guys, that's always the case. The glory of the kingdoms of this world don't last. Persia would be conquered by Greece and Alexander the Great. But Alexander the Great would be conquered by Rome. Rome would implode upon itself and be destroyed. And we see this over and over again as you go through history. Modern dynasties don't last. Germany was defeated. The, the former USSR, the Soviet Union, doesn't exist anymore, even though Putin, he's trying to, to win it back, right? He's trying to put it back together again. And even this great power, this country that, that the world looks at and says that we are a superpower, America is on decline. Morally, economically, militarily, and most of all, spiritually. But we have people in power in our government that think we're still the end all. We have a governor in California who thinks that, you know, he's the, the, the final voice. There's people in Washington that think that they are the ones who are in control. But the reality is, is God is on the throne. <laughs> that he is sovereign in the affairs of men and his plan is going to be carried out. And we must remember that when we come into dark days and dark times. One of the things we're going to see in the book of Esther, there's, there's going to be some dark days, scary days, some scary times, but God is at work. Now, for the remainder of our time today, this is what the Lord really put upon my heart to have us do, is I want us to contrast the glory and the kingdoms of man and put them in contrast with the glory of the kingdom of God. Here we see this picture in the opening of this book of just how great and awesome and glorious the kingdom of Persia was. 
And even though there's no mention of God in this book, the God who is over all, whose kingdom is over all, is working behind the scenes. And we're going to see his glory and greatness prevail. So let's do, let, let's look at this, this comparison. If you're taking notes, first of all, the glory of man is fleeting. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24, all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower fade, falls away. Man's glory is fading. You know, you can go right now to the flower fields in Carlsbad, and they're gorgeous, right? You see them from the freeway, and just gorgeous. But a few months from now, they're not going to be there. Fades. It's how the glory of man is. It's fading. It doesn't last. We see that over and over again. These kingdoms fall. Now, I'm also going to ask you today to do a little bit of turning in your Bible because some of the passages that I want to look at are, are a little bit too big to put on the screen. So, so just go from Esther a little bit to the right, just through Job, and find your way to Psalms. And find Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2. Because whereas the glory of the kingdoms of this world are fading, the glory of God's kingdom is permanent. Look at Psalm 1, Psalm 2, verse 1. It says, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers to, uh, gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. And then it says this, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. I love that. The nations of the world come and say, hey, we're going to show just how great we are. It's the Tower of Babel. We're going to build a tower to the heavens. And God just laughs. How foolish. God just laughs. And the Lord scoffs at them. They have no idea. They have no idea who they're messing with. The Lord rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. It's one king. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul said this, that one day, Everyone is going to kneel. Every person, every former king is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I mean, think about this. Napoleon is going to confess. Napoleon actually did when he was alive that there was no other king but, but Jesus. Mussolini. Newsom, Biden, whoever, okay? They're going to confess that Jesus is the Lord. Now, here's the thing. You can confess that today. You can bow your heart today. Or you can say, ah, oh, I think I'm going to wait. I'm going to see how this plays out. But if you wait, it could be too late. One king on the throne who's kingdom is permanent. Another thing, the kingdom of men are meant to cause envy. That's what this was all about, this big party. It was to say, look how great I am. I am so much greater than you. It's kind of like Instagram posts, right? People put, you know, on Instagram their perfect life. And they put all these pictures and everything's just awesome. And you look at it and go, gosh, their life is so much better than mine. Their house is so much greater than mine. Can you imagine a Hasarerus' Instagram post if he had one? <laughs> like he's putting out all his gold glasses, you know, his, his china wear, all his gold. And none of them are the same. I mean, they've just been so handcrafted. I mean, this was the, the point. Look how cool I am. Look how rich I am. But get this. Where the kingdoms of man are meant to cause envy, the kingdom of God is meant to cause wonder. In Psalm 19, 
David wrote these words, the heavens proclaim the glory of God and the skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak and night after night, they make him known. The heavens declare. The heavens, in other words, are giving us a glimpse of just how great God is. Now think about this. Today at sunset, if you go down to the beach, you will see hundreds of people lining the coast doing this. Getting a picture of the sunset. Every single day. And not just here, all over the world. Why? Because in, in that, it's so glorious. And, and even, I mean, think about this. People stand there for an hour or longer just to get a glimpse of, of this that David says. This is just a glimpse of the glory of God and how awesome and how majestic he is. And even the best painters who can paint, you know, a, a, a copy of the sunset, people don't stand there and stare at the picture for hours because it's just not the same. People look through a telescope and they see the stars and the galaxies and all of that is meant to give us this, this little taste and glimpse of how great God is. C.S. Lewis said this, nature creates a longing in the soul of man that it cannot fill. It's the invitation to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And note those glimpses into God's glory are meant to create within us a confidence, a realization, a reminder, you're on the throne. You're the one, the Bible says, who's holding all this together in the span of his hand. You're the one, Lord, who is the creator of the world and the sustainer of the world. And the Bible says this, that he sustains it by the word of his power. It's amazing. And listen, this is why when King David, or when David, the little shepherd boy David, is coming to the scene at the battle there in the Valley of Elah, where you have the children of Israel on one side and the Philistines on another side and this valley in between, he comes on this scene and sees it different from everybody else. Because in the middle of the valley is the big giant Goliath, who every single day, get this, for 40 days, twice a day, he's saying, send me a man. And no one would come. They were scared to death. But David comes on the scene and goes, who is this uncircumcised Philistines? That he would defy the armies of the living God. Who is it? Who's this guy think he is? Why did David, little David, 15-year-old boy, because right before that, those who have put together the chronological Bible tell us that that's when David writes Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. So it's in that moment that David, he's coming from, from seeing and, and, and thinking about and meditating on the greatness of God that he comes to the battle and sees the Goliath and goes, he's a shrimp in comparison to my God. The glory of God is meant to cause within us a sense of, of confidence. Here's another one. The kingdom and glory of man is guarded. You know, you could only go to the party in Persia if you had an invitation. I mean, nobody could just roll up. Hey, I'm going to go check out the party. When I was in high school... My senior year, a friend of mine named Tim, he, he and I, we had later curfews than all of our friends. So when we'd be hanging out on a Friday night and our friends would have to go home around 10 or whatever it was, and we didn't have to be home till like midnight or something, we were like, well, what, what should we do? So this is what we started doing. We, we had a lot of hotels around Orange County where I grew up. So we started going to hotels, and we would just kind of uh, make our way into wedding receptions. <laughs> and we're taking on the food. Or, or high school proms, okay? 
Now, we stood out like a thor, sore thumb. I mean, everybody's like in tuxes and prom dresses, and we're in jeans and T-shirts, and we're going and we're eating the food. And quite a few times, we got chased out by security guards, okay? Well, that's the same thing here in Persia. You couldn't just come rolling in. If you didn't have an invitation, you would be chased out. But get this, if you got an invitation, you were expected to be there. Because if you were gone, the king would be like, okay, why weren't you at my party? And you better have a good explanation of that. But here's the thing. As I said earlier, this whole deal was an opulent attempt at manipulation. That the, that the king was saying, hey, I want you to come to my party because I need you to be a part of my war. That was the whole point. It was guarded. It was protected. But listen, the kingdom of God is meant to be shared. I want you to turn a couple more places from Psalms, go through Proverbs, Song of Solomon, to the book of Isaiah. Keep going to your right. And find your way to Isaiah chapter 6. It's a beautiful sound, the sound of the pages of a Bible turning. I love that. Isaiah chapter 6, we read this in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory, and the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So Isaiah, catch this. He gets this vision of heaven, the heavenly scene. Sees God sitting on his throne. And the train, picture this, of his robe, it's filling the whole temple. And there's angels and there's smoke and they're crying out, holy, holy. It is an ominous picture. And I want you to notice Isaiah's reaction. Look at verse 5. He says, so I said, woe is me for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In, this, in this, this moment of seeing the glory of God, Isaiah's like, man, I'm toast. Now, here's what's interesting. For the first six chapter, first five chapters of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet is saying to everyone else, woe is you. And woe is you in this middle section, and woe is you over here, and woe, especially woe is you over on this side. Yeah, I mean, that's what he's saying. Woe is everybody, and when he sees God in his glory, what does he say? Woe is me. I'm undone. You see, that's what the glory of God does, is it's so glorious, it's so amazing, it causes us to come into this, that place that we see our sin. I mean, if Jesus came cruising into our gathering here this morning in his glory, none of you would be going, yeah, that's my homeboy, you know? <laughs> hey, bro, give me five. No, no, no. We would be on our faces in the midst of his glory. This is where Isaiah finds himself. But what happens next is so incredible. Look at verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Now, don't miss this. Isaiah is in the presence of glory He's brought face to face with his sin and the sense of how I don't belong here. I don't belong in this space. I don't, I don't belong in the presence of glory. That's his reaction. And then we see God moving toward him, though, to want him to understand that he does belong, that God wants him there. And what, we, what we're seeing here is a, a really a picture of the gospel. The angel come, touches him. His, his sin is purged. 
And God was saying, I want you to share in my glory. You know, the psalmist wrote these words, who can ascend into the house of the hill of the Lord, the house of the Lord, into his glorious temple? Only he who has a clean hands and a pure heart. And we hear that and go, well, that, that leaves me out. I don't have clean hands. I don't have a pure heart. That eliminates us. It's what the Bible says. Our sins separated us from a holy God. But this is what that holy God did. He said, I'm going to deal with your sin. I'm going to send my son Jesus to come and die on the cross and pay the price for your sins so that you can come into my presence, that you can share in my glory because I want to share my glory. So he gives this invitation, whosoever will, let him come. In other words, everyone's invited, but there's a criteria. Only special people, only certain people, only royals and, and, and those in power were invited, invited to the party in Persia. But everyone is invited to the party in heaven. Everyone's invited into the party in God's presence. But here's the criteria is that there's only one name upon which you can have entrance and be saved. And that is the name of Jesus. And so God says, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And on the cross, Jesus cried, it is finished. The work of salvation is done. And the Bible says at that moment, the veil in the temple, into the holy place, that only the high priest could come in only one day of the year and, and only for just a very short period of time, the veil was rent in two from top to bottom. As God ripped it in half and he was saying, open house, you can all come. And the writer of Hebrews tells us that we are now, because of what Jesus did, he says, come boldly. Come boldly into the throne of grace that you might receive grace and mercy in your time of need. And I want you to notice one last thing here. After Isaiah is purged of his sin, notice what happens next. It says, and also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. In this moment, after being purged, he's invited into partnership with God to be his messenger. And Jesus has done the same thing for us. He says, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. I want you to go into all the world and let people know, hey, there's another kingdom. There's a kingdom that is coming. So here's the question. How are God's people to live in a godless society? Do we blend in? No. Are we meant to assimilate? No. We're meant to stand out and to assist. We were made for this moment, but we have to see this world for what it is. That it's the kingdom of the world. It's a secondary kingdom. And we need to understand that we have been called by God to a greater kingdom. Moses understood this. When Moses was being raised as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, there in Egypt, and he was being, being brought into a place of prominence and power, and he was a military general, but all of a sudden Moses comes to this place where he sees and understands, I have been, I belong to another kingdom, and, 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 and so we read in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith Moses, when he came of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Isn't that glorious? Guys, that's how we are to live, that we belong to another kingdom, that we are to be image bearers of the glory of that kingdom. And I'm going to close with this. How do we do that? Paul wrote these words in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. 
How does it happen? As we keep our eyes on Jesus. As we look to Jesus, as we draw near to Jesus, God says, I'm doing a work of transforming you to make you more like my son, to make you ready for my kingdom. And so we need to keep our eyes on him. Keep our focus on who is our king. Amen?